it's finally here. Hello everybody, my name is Liam, and welcome to the Star Wars Lads How to Adapt the Original Thrawn Trilogy into Canon. But before we get started, hit that like button down below, subscribe to the channel for Star Wars content three days a week, and comment below and let me know what you think of this video, whether you think I missed something important, whether you would do something a little differently, let me know down below. I want to hear your thoughts and I always respond. So a couple weeks ago, the final book in the Thrawn Ascendancy trilogy, Thrawn Ascendancy Lesser Evil, came out, capping off a six-book run by Timothy Zahn in the current Star Wars canon about Thrawn. This got me kind of thinking about the original Thrawn trilogy, the one that made us all fall in love with the character in the first place, and how it could fit back into canon. The original Thrawn trilogy is the most important and the most influential Star Wars EU story ever told. Without its success, Star Wars wouldn't have become the multimedia juggernaut that it is today. And well, if you ask me, that would be pretty darn sad. However, due to the age of the material, a lot of the pieces of this original Thrawn trilogy no longer fit into a post-prequel Star Wars world. But that's not to say that a lot of the plot can't be translated directly into canon. I'm going to tell you how by going over three key elements to the original Thrawn trilogy. First, the world that makes up the original Thrawn trilogy. In this section, we're going to look at what makes up the galaxy in three books from the settings to the species in a very different 90s terminology that was used and more. Then we're going to take a look at the trilogy's key characters, both of those who have already been adapted into canon and those who have yet to make the canon transition. Then finally, we're going to look at the plot of a canon adaptation of this trilogy, what it would most likely look like when it comes to the trilogy's most prevalent plot points and where the story will most likely take place inside the current canon. Okay, so now let's establish the world of the original Thrawn trilogy, starting with setting. The first major logistical problem with the original Thrawn trilogy, translating into canon, is the location of the New Republic capital. In the Thrawn trilogy, the New Republic's capital is on Coruscant, with the former Imperial Capitol building being recycled into the New Republic Capitol building. If you've read the canon Aftermath trilogy or have watched The Force Awakens, then you know this aspect of the story no longer fits in the canon. Immediately post the Battle of Endor, the New Republic sets up its temporary capital on the planet Chandrilla, the homeworld of the rebel leader Mon Mothma, who becomes the first Chancellor of the New Republic Senate. Later, the New Republic capital was relocated to the Hosnian system, specifically on the world Hosnian Prime, which was later destroyed by the First Order's Starkiller-based superweapon. Another incredibly important location in the trilogy is the planet Wayland. In Heir to the Empire, Wayland is the location of Emperor Palpatine's secret storehouse built into Mount Tantus. It also serves as the location for our introduction to Dark Jedi Jeruis Sabaoth in the first book, as well as the location of the Spa'arti cloning cylinders that Thrawn uses to create his new clone army, and the location of the final battle in The Last Command, which sees our heroes take on Master Sabaoth and the clone Luuk. More on them later. Unlike most of the other planets from the Thrawn trilogy, Wayland has been given a similarly important role in canon as the location for a secret cloning project that most of us infer is related to Palpatine's clones and the creation of Snoke as seen in The Mandalorian Chapter 12, The Siege, and The Rise of Skywalker. We won't know exactly how all of this is connected until next year when the Bad Batch Season 2 releases, but Wayland will continue to serve as an important cloning location in canon. Other prominent locations in the Thrawn trilogy such as Merker, Sluis Vaughn, Jomark, or Honiger, all officially being part of canon but haven't yet served any role of note in any of these stories. This means these planets could basically be assimilated into an adaptation of the trilogy without contradiction. The Thrawn trilogy features two distinct species that have yet to play a major role in canon yet, the East Salamiri and the Nogri. The East Salamiri are a species of lizard-like tree-dwelling animals native to the forests of the planet Merkur, with a unique ability to mute a Force user's connection to the Force. Grand Admiral Thrawn discovers this ability of the East Salamiri and uses them to gain an upper hand against Luke and Leia, as well as his unstable ally, Master Jeruis Sabaoth. The likeness of the East Salamiri has also appeared in canon as an art piece in Grand Admiral Thrawn's office in Star Wars Rebels, but the species itself has yet to play a role in canon. This means they could technically be directly adapted back into the canon at some point. If I'm stepping away from an objective look at the material for a moment, I personally am not a huge fan of the way the East Salamiri's force dampening powers are conceptually presented in the Thrawn trilogy. While the way they're used in the novels was fine for a time when no Star Wars material existed outside of the original trilogy, in today's context their powers feel too much like a science fiction-y plot device to stifle the power of force users to give the average Joes the upper hand. Again, I actually think the concept works quite well in the novels themselves, but if I were translating the material to canon, 
I would either remove them entirely and have Thrawn figure out a more cunning way to deal with Force users, or change their powers to be more in line with the prequel idea of the dark side of the Force being able to cloud the judgment of light side wielders. The Nogri are easily the single most important alien race across all three books in the original Thrawn trilogy. In the books, the Nogri are a species of highly trained assassins loyal to the Empire and Grand Admiral Thrawn, but most specifically, Darth Vader. When a Nogri attempt to kidnap Leia Organa Solo on Kashyyyk is thwarted, one of the Nogri named Kabarak ceases hostilities after recognizing Leia as the Malari Ush, or the Daughter of the Savior. In the original Thrawn trilogy, the Nogri people believed Darth Vader had saved their planet from a crashed ship full of noxious chemicals that would have destroyed their planet. Because of this, the Nogri swore allegiance to Vader and by extension his offspring, Leia and Luke. Once Leia helps the Nogri discover that the Empire didn't save them, but in fact continued to poison their planet in order to keep the warrior people subjugated under Imperial rule, the Nogri silently switched allegiances to the New Republic and helped them from the shadows as bodyguards on a variety of missions, including Rook's ultimate assassination of Grand Admiral Thrawn. They are one of the most integral threads on Weaves throughout the story, and when it comes to canon, they could still serve a similar purpose since we only know about Rook when it comes to the Nogri in canon, but Thrawn would have to be killed in a different way. Beginning with the obvious, these novels use a lot of terminology that is contradictory to a lot of Star Wars mythology post-prequels. The term Dark Jedi is used not only to describe Master Jeruus Sabaoth, who technically would still be classified as a Dark Jedi in canon, but also characters like Darth Vader and Emperor Palpatine. At this point in time, the term Sith wasn't a clearly defined term and wouldn't get established as the official term for Vader and Palpatine until The Phantom Menace was released in 1999. Since the original Thrawn trilogy was written before two-thirds of the Star Wars Skywalker saga films were made, there are a lot of opinions, biases, and ideas that contradict much of what we know about the prequel era. To me, the most prevalent and probably the most contradictory is that the Jedi are viewed as near deities amongst the masses. From what we know of the Clone Wars and Rebels eras, Jedi are still viewed with a sense of awe because of their rarity, but there are plenty of people who knew Jedi and were around Jedi before they were wiped out. The view of the Jedi in the original Thrawn trilogy seems to be a bit too reverent for the time period. The Katana fleet doesn't yet exist in canon. That doesn't mean it can't. In Legends, the titular Dark Force of the second book in this trilogy was a 200-ship fleet of Dreadnought-class heavy cruisers that was launched in the waning days of the Galactic Republic in hopes of restoring the failing government's navy. The Katana fleet is one of the central MacGuffins of both Heir to the Empire and Dark Force Rising, with both Han, Lando, the New Republic, and Thrawn and his Imperial Remnant desperately searching the galaxy in order to use the Dark Force to bolster their fleets. Obviously, this plot point would need a lot of changing, especially with the New Republic's demilitarization effort that began in 4 ABY. Contrarily, though, we do see that the New Republic has at least a moderate military presence throughout the galaxy in The Mandalorian, so by 9 ABY, they haven't completely demilitarized. To me, this concept still can work, though, especially if we tie it together with a tweaked version of... Cloning serves as one of the biggest and most expansive plot points in the original Thrawn trilogy. And, well, it doesn't necessarily fit into canon too well with what we know of cloning now. In the original Thrawn trilogy, 90s readers, still 11 years removed from Attack of the Clones, got their first look at what a clone war might look like when Grand Admiral Thrawn unveils his secret clone army at the end of Dark Force Rising. Using secret Sparty cloning cylinders stored in the Mount Tantus warehouse on Wayland, Thrawn is able to create a clone army big enough to command an entire fleet of Dreadnought-class starships. In Legends, Sparty cloning cylinders could grow a fully adult human clone in around a year, whereas in both canon and legends, Kaminoan cloning took about 10 years. Thrawn's clone armies aren't the only Sparty grown clones in the original Thrawn trilogy. Clones of a former Jedi Master Joris Sabaoth and Luke Skywalker also play roles in the story. With all of this said, it's not that the Sparty cloning cylinders can't find a place in a canon adaptation of this narrative, but an entire clone army created with Sparty cloning cylinders does not really work in a canon context in my opinion. The Clone Wars and now the Bad Batch have offered us loads of information on both the exclusivity and the effectiveness of the Kaminoan cloning process, and we get a glimpse of the future Kaminoan cloning during the reign of the Empire at the end of the Bad Batch Season 1. While it's still hypothetically possible for Thrawn to use secret experimental Sparty cloning cylinders in canon to make his own army, to me that would detract from the importance of the Jango Fett clones that the creatives behind the Clone Wars and the Bad Batch animated series have worked so hard to develop over the last 13 years. 
but there is a way to still make cloning a part of this story if we ditch the spar decloning cylinders. To make the clones of Jango Fett that we know from the Clone Wars and the Bad Batch the owners of the Katana fleet. At the end of the Bad Batch Season 1, Kamino is evacuated and the remaining clone army is taken somewhere unknown to the audience. I think it would be incredible for the Bad Batch to find these clones in subsequent seasons, lead a revolution, steal a small fleet of Star Destroyers, and jump into hyperspace never to be heard from again. We can then connect the Jango Fett clones back into our canon Heir to the Empire naturally to truly make it the final standoff between our episodes 1 through 6 heroes. Obviously this means the Katana fleet will be much smaller than it is in the books, but I think this idea could definitely work in concept. Now that we've already established the world that the story takes place in, let's take a look at the characters themselves that will populate it. Starting with the characters that have already been translated into canon, and then moving on to the characters that haven't. For the purpose of this video, we are only going to be looking at the characters that are most important to the original Thrawn trilogy story. Obviously, we should start this section by talking about the character whom the Thrawn trilogy is literally named after. In canon, Grand Admiral Thrawn has appeared most prominently in two forms of Star Wars media, the animated and television series Star Wars Rebels Season 3 and 4, and the six novels by Timothy Zahn, Thrawn, Thrawn Alliances, Thrawn Treason, and Thrawn Ascendancy, Chaos Rising, Greater Good, and Lesser Evil. Over the course of Thrawn's canon appearances, the character has been given far more depth, prominence, and perspective than he was given in the original Thrawn trilogy. In fact, I would go as far to say that the canon portrays him as much more of an anti-hero than a villain. Canon Thrawn is every bit as cunning, intelligent, and opportunistic as he is in the original Thrawn trilogy, but he's also compassionate, loyal, and imperfect. Zahn has made a strong point to highlight Thrawn's deficiencies, such as his understanding of politics in his canon novels, while also giving us greater insight into the way he analyzes, strategizes, and arrives at conclusions. As great as Thrawn is as a pure villain in the original Thrawn trilogy, there are times where he seems to just purely be omniscient. Since most of the Thrawn moments in those books are seen through the eyes of Captain Peleon, we never really get a look at how Thrawn arrives at some of his incredible deductions. He just kind of does. Basically what I'm getting at is that while Thrawn works extremely well as a villain in both Rebels and the original Thrawn trilogy, the novels have transformed him into one of the more fleshed out antiheroes in canon. Even when he makes decisions that the reader might disagree with him about morally, the reader's still always rooting for him. So in my opinion, he would be the character that would need the most change if we're going to adapt the original Thrawn trilogy plot and bring it into canon. He can no longer be just a pure, ruthless Imperial Avenger. He needs to be given logical reasons outside of Imperial patriotism for his actions. This points to the second biggest change in Thrawn from the original Thrawn trilogy to his canon stories. He's not really an Imperial loyalist. Sure, Thrawn spends over a decade rising through the Imperial ranks, winning countless battles for the Empire, and crushing rebel uprisings, but from the first canon Thrawn novel through the last, it is made clear Thrawn does everything he does for the good of the Chiss ascendancy. The original Thrawn trilogy novels depict the character as a determined Imperial officer with the sole purpose of quashing the rebellion and restoring the Empire's glory. Canon Thrawn joins the Empire on the secret orders of Supreme General Bakif of the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet after the spiteful syndicure of the Chiss ascendancy demand Thrawn to be exiled due to the unorthodox and illegal methods he uses to defeat the Grisk forces led by their leader, Jixtus. After a chance encounter with Anakin Skywalker during the Clone Wars, Thrawn feels that an alliance between the two powerhouse governments, the Empire and the Chiss Ascendancy, would strengthen the Chiss grip over the Unknown Regions and limit threats from within the Chaos. While Thrawn wants this alliance to last, he is very clear that the Chiss Ascendancy is his priority. To me, this is the biggest challenge when adapting the original Thrawn trilogy plot in the canon. It can't just feature the Empire, it also has to feature the Chiss Ascendancy. Canon Thrawn would not fight the New Republic on behalf of the Empire if he felt the New Republic could provide better resources or stronger alliances for the Chiss Ascendancy. In my opinion, any canon appearance of Thrawn as an antagonist post-Return of the Jedi must start with the disaster falling upon the Chiss Ascendancy. Whatever it is, in order to adapt the original Thrawn trilogy story properly into canon, Thrawn would need both a Chiss-related purpose and a more humanizing characterization in order to make the character canonically consistent. One of the big reasons the original Thrawn trilogy has endured the test of time is the characterizations of its original trilogy characters. Zahn writes all of their dialogue so naturally and their actions never feel out of line with their portrayals on screen. Probably my favorite of all of Zahn's original trilogy characters in the original Thrawn trilogy is his portrayal of Luke. In the novels, Luke is kind and wise, while never displaying arrogance. 
He also is hungry for knowledge, but still has self-doubts because the rest of the galaxy wants to put him on a pedestal. From what we've seen of Luke during this time period, this all could be easily translated. We know he spends most of his first few years post-Return of the Jedi hunting for Jedi knowledge and artifacts to make himself the best Jedi he can be. We also know that at the time of the Mandalorian, he is also looking for students to start his new Jedi Academy. There's really nothing about Luke's character or his intentions from the original Thrawn trilogy that needs to be changed. He could fit directly into a canon adaptation of this story seamlessly. Of the original Big Three, Leia's storyline is the one that would need the most change. Beginning with the obvious, in the original Thrawn trilogy, one of the most prominent parts of Leia's story is that she is pregnant with twins. In canon, however, she and Han only have one child, Ben, and he was born a few years earlier during the Aftermath trilogy. Leia is also actively training to be a Jedi in the original Thrawn trilogy, and it is known throughout the galaxy that she has the ability to wield the Force. In canon, Leia gives up being a Jedi relatively early in her training. We don't know exactly when she stops her training, but from most of the stories that take place between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens, it is not a widely known fact that Leia has the ability to use the Force, nor is it known that she's Darth Vader's daughter until around 28 ABY during the novel Bloodline. Leia also spends most of Heir to the Empire and Dark Force Rising either on the run trying to avoid being kidnapped and taken to Master Sabaoth, or trying to help the Nogri. Both of these plot points could still work in canon, but I'd personally like to see her a little bit more involved in the political side of the New Republic like she is in The Last Command, because that seems to be more closely aligned to her role in canon. Han is Han in the original Thrawn trilogy. He teams up a lot with Lando, he goes on missions more fitted for a smuggler or a scoundrel, and makes a lot of sarcastic remarks. Pretty much everything he does would fit right into a canon version of the story, so no major changes would need to be made to the character. Again, similar to Han, the Lando from these novels could very much so be directly adapted into canon, mostly because we don't know much about what he does between Return of the Jedi and the Rise of Skywalker. In Heir to the Empire, Lando has started a new mining operation on the world of Nyklon, which Thrawn invades in order to steal some of Lando's mole miner ships for later use in remote piloting the Katana fleet in Dark Force Rising. As far as canon is concerned, this could all still be possible in an adaptation. <laughs> I wanted to mention them, but again, these versions of these characters from the original Thrawn trilogy are all spot on with their current canon versions, so adapting them from this timeline really wouldn't be too difficult. They serve important roles in the original Thrawn trilogy's narrative, but both would have to be altered slightly to work in canon, although I do think some political intrigue and deception in the early days of the New Republic would still be quite interesting. At this point in the canon timeline, it seems the New Republic is far more settled and organized than it was in the original Thrawn trilogy. Peleon is technically a part of canon, but has yet to play any role of significance outside of a small appearance in Thrawn Treason and a mention in Star Wars Rebels Season 4. In the original Thrawn trilogy, Peleon is your typical Imperial officer, old, clean-cut, and by the book. He serves directly as Thrawn's second-in-command, and as I said earlier, much of what we see or know about Thrawn comes from his point of view in these novels. With all of that said, he could be adapted directly from the original Thrawn trilogy without any alteration to his character traits, personality, or role in the story whatsoever. Our last major villain from the original Thrawn trilogy that has played a significant role in canon is Thrawn's personal bodyguard and favored Nogri assassin, Rook. In canon, Rook has appeared both in the Thrawn novels and Star Wars Rebels. Unfortunately for Rook, he does appear to die via electrocution in Star Wars Rebels, so we most likely won't be seeing him in any adaptation of the original Thrawn trilogy. For those of you who have read the books, you know this presents a massive change for the ending of The Last Command, because Rook is in fact the one who kills Thrawn at the end of the novel. Now let's move on to the characters that have not been translated into canon. I wanted to start with Mara Jade because she's integral to Luke Skywalker's character development both in the original Thrawn trilogy and throughout the future of the Star Wars EU. Contrary to the popular belief of those who want to restore the EU and discard canon, there is very little reason Mara Jade can't be adapted into Star Wars canon. Obviously, as with all the characters I'm going to talk about in this section, parts of her story have to be altered to make sense in the canon timeline. But really not as much as you'd think. 
A deep dive into adapting Mara's entire story into canon is a video for another time, but for now, let's look at what would need to be done to the character to adapt her into a canon version of the original Thrawn trilogy. And there really isn't that much. There still isn't really any character like her in canon, and her story in this book doesn't directly contradict any canon story beats we know now. Plus, the Emperor's hands are in canon, with Gar Saxon having served the role in Star Wars Rebels. This is a character I really want to see make the transition into canon, because it would open up a whole new world of possibilities for Luke's journey from Return of the Jedi to The Last Jedi. Talon Card would also be another easy character to adapt directly from the original Thrawn trilogy to canon. He might feel a bit familiar in today's context with how many smuggler pirate type characters we've seen over the last few years, but he still works in a canon context. There are so many great things about Master Jeruus Sabaoth that I would love to see adapted into canon. For a little context from legends on who this character is, Master Jorus Sabaoth was a Jedi Master who served the Republic during the Clone Wars. However, upon his death, Sabaoth was cloned by Palpatine in the new clone Jeruus Sabaoth, trust me, the extra U in the name gets even more ridiculous in a later character, eventually found his way to Palpatine's storehouse on Wayland killing the Guardian and taking his place. When Thrawn eventually arrives on Wayland, he makes an uneasy alliance with Sabaoth, promising he captured Luke and Leia for him in exchange for Sabaoth using a form of battle meditation to enhance the collective unity of the Imperial Navy, which according to Thrawn was also used by the Emperor and was the reason for the Empire's overwhelming military power. Sabaoth agrees but continues to pursue his own machinations behind Thrawn's back. Because Sabaoth was cloned with the Sparty cloning cylinders, his mind was beginning to decay and he was descending into madness. As I said earlier, cloning is used very liberally in the original Thrawn trilogy and in a way that would most definitely not translate into canon today, but I love the way this character struggles with living up to the image of the Jedi he was cloned from while simultaneously pursuing his own twisted version of what he believes the Jedi should be. Even though this character hasn't directly been adapted into canon yet, he has influenced a couple of characters in canon. Visually, former Jedi Terran Malakos from the video game Jedi Fallen Order has been compared to Sabaoth. When it comes to the cloning aspect, however, a comparison to Supreme Leader Snoke could also be made, but their personalities are extremely different. So now let's look at how to adapt Sabaoth directly. For the most part, his character traits and goals would be able to directly translate to canon without much problem. What would need to be altered would be the role of the Sparty cloning cylinders and the inconsistent way Jedi are observed by the rest of the galaxy populace. When it comes to the obsessive idolization for the Jedi that we see from a lot of civilians around Sabaoth in this book, we could just attribute that to his dark powers of manipulation in canon. There is also a great scene in The Last Command where an Imperial officer has an almost drug addict-like reaction when Sabaoth disconnects his mind from the officer's mind through the Force. Again, it'd be awesome to see the Force used in such a way by someone who's literally insane and there's no reason it couldn't work in canon. Remember when I mentioned that clone names got even more ridiculous? Meet Luke Skywalker, a Spa'arti cylinder grown clone of Luke created from the hand that he lost on Bespin. Luke doesn't have a very large role in the novel, but he technically could still work in canon. Again, it just comes down to the way Spa'arti cloning is able to fit amongst the much more strict and rare use of cloning in a post-prequel, post-Clone Wars world, rather than was initially envisioned in the early 90s over a decade before Attack of the Clones was even released. Phalia is a Bothan politician and serves an interesting role as the chief political antagonist of our heroes in this novel. Like I said earlier, it would be interesting to explore the political turmoil within the New Republic and canon, but Phalia's arc might not work if we keep the 9 ABY timeline, because the New Republic seems to be far more politically well established. Finally, let's look at the narrative as a whole and how it might get translated into canon. As I've discussed throughout this video, there's really no reason we can't save most of this story. In fact, I think we can save about 75% of this story if we were to translate it directly into the books. If you are a purist for the original Thrawn trilogy, I would highly recommend you hope we get a book adaptation of this story. Because I think if they do it in the films and television, it's not going to be nearly as accurate. If we're being honest though, it's really impossible to ignore all the seeds they've planted throughout Star Wars over the last few years that the original Thrawn trilogy is returning. Whether it's Grand Admiral Thrawn name dropped in The Mandalorian Season 2, or the emphasis on cloning that's been in The Mandalorian, The Bad Batch, The Rise of Skywalker, The Clone Wars, 
throughout this entire last few years, especially the Disney Plus era of Star Wars, cloning has been at the center of all this. And well, it really does hint at the original Thrawn trilogy returning. It seems like Dave Filoni and John Favreau really want to give us this interlocked, huge, grand epic to end the original trilogy timeline and start the sequel timeline to give us a bit more of a bridge that we didn't have when we got the sequel trilogy. I think they're really going to do a great job redeeming it, but there are going to be some major changes if we're talking about a direct literal translation from the original Thrawn trilogy books to the screen. If I'm being realistic, I think that means the first thing to go would be our original trilogy characters. As much as I personally am starting to become more comfortable with recasting original trilogy characters, if that means we get great live action stories that continue their exploits during the 30 year gap, most people, I think Lucasfilm included, still aren't on board with that. That unfortunately means the Mandalorian adaptation will not feature Leia, Han, Chewbacca, Lando, C-3PO, or R2-D2, but my fingers would be crossed for a small role for Luke in the grand finale, which would also bring back Groku. Instead, these characters will most likely be replaced by the heavy hitters of Filoni's animated series like Ahsoka Tano, Ezra Bridger, Sabine Wren, Captain Rex, and more, all of whom who have actual history with Grand Admiral Thrawn. Clone Wars and Rebels characters will be joined by characters already introduced in The Mandalorian like Din Djarin, Grogu, Grief Karga, Boba Fett, Fennec Shan, and anyone else introduced in The Book of Boba Fett or Ahsoka. So this is how I would stage a canon version of the Thrawn trilogy in the Mandalorian universe. I'm just going to give you a few key plot points for how I would set the stage for these events. If you want to see a full plot outline with character arcs for my version of the Thrawn trilogy in the Mandalorian universe, let me know down below and I'd be happy to turn that outline into its own video. The constant infighting and hubris of the Chiss Syndicure has led to its downfall at the hands of the Grisks during Thrawn's exile to the Empire. Thrawn returns home to Chila years after Ezra and the Pergil launched the Chimera into the Unknown Regions to find the Ascendancy all but destroyed. All that remains is a small force of the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet led by Admiral Aralani and former Imperial Eli Vanto. In hopes that he can rebuild the Chiss Ascendancy, Thrawn and Vanto reach out to the Empire for support against the Grisks. But upon returning to lesser space, Thrawn and Vanto discover that the Empire has also lost its grip on the galaxy. Emperor Palpatine is dead, and the last stand of the main Imperial forces led by Gallius Rax ended in defeat on Jakku. Caught between two lives, both of which are falling completely apart, Thrawn must devise a way to salvage what is left of his allies and create a joint armada of both Imperial Remnants and Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet. Using his prestige and connections to the Empire, Thrawn is able to lure many of the surviving important Imperial officers, such as Moff Gideon and Captain Peleon, to his side by promising the annihilation of the New Republic and the restoration of the Empire. But his secret endgame will be the restoration of a stronger Chiss Ascendancy, one that expands throughout the galaxy controlling all of the areas of lesser space originally ruled by the Empire, but also an Ascendancy that is far friendlier to alien beings and worlds. In order to do this, Thrawn and Gideon put many warlords in place throughout the galaxy as they slowly conquer planets and gain supplies to rebuild their forces. Thrawn leaves Gideon in charge of most of the remaining Imperial forces and bases, as they develop secret technologies like the Dark Troopers and continue secret cloning operations led by Nala Se on Wayland. Using her now restored third sight, the Chiss term for precognitive force abilities, in order to make their travels more difficult to track, former Skywalker Thalius leads Thrawn and Vanto through the unknown regions in search of the long forgotten Katana fleet. The last fleet of Venator class Star Destroyers, stolen from the Empire during the final uprising of the clones of Jango Fett, led by the Bad Batch. Thrawn hopes to destroy the remaining clones and use the Katana fleet to bolster his naval force. Since the Katana fleet disappeared decades ago, only three Republic Jango Fett clones have been seen, Rex, Wolf, and Gregor, all of whom allied with the Rebel Alliance. However, rumors of a fourth clone living amongst a group of ex-Crimson Dawn smugglers on the planet Merkur led by Talon Card emerge after a skirmish between Boba Fett's new galactically unified criminal syndicate and Kira's remaining forces of Crimson Dawn. Thrawn, Vanto, and Thalius attempt to travel to Merkur, but Thalius is having a difficult time seeing the path through hyperspace. Upon finally arriving on the planet, Thalius's severe spiritual reaction to the planet reminds Thrawn of his studies of an art piece of an animal, rumored to be extinct, that naturally disrupted the flow of the force around them. Thrawn infers these creatures, known in the legends as East Salamiri, must be on Merkur. He makes the deal with Card to harvest the East Salamiri in exchange for acknowledging Card's syndicate's rule of the planet rather than impose an imperial slash chiss occupation. Thrawn secretly leaves a spy on the planet to report the appearance of the fourth clone should he appear. Before Thrawn arrived, however, Card hid the fourth clone revealed to be Cut Laquane, determined to keep his existence a secret. 
Concerned with their sudden involvement with the Empire, Card helps Cut leave Merker to seek out Rex and the New Republic. Meanwhile, on Wayland, an adult Strand cast clone has been created using the genetic template of a long-lost Jedi turned Sith acolyte, Joris Savioth, spliced together with genetic samples of Darth Sidious's DNA and the midichlorians taken from Grogu on Navarro. The Jedi Ezra Bridger, who after departing lesser space with Thrawn in the Chimera, spent the last decade scouring the unknown regions for secrets pertaining to Mortis and the world between worlds. Meanwhile, Moff Gideon has been captured by the Mandalorians, Din Djarin and Bo-Katan Kreis, and Djarin has unwillingly laid claim to the Darksaber after defeating Gideon in combat. At the same time, Luke Skywalker is searching the galaxy for young Force sensitives as he attempts to use the knowledge he's gained over the past few years to start a new Jedi Academy. This leads him across the path of Jaren where he takes the youngling Grogu as his student. After an extensive search for the lost Jedi Ezra Bridger, Ahsoka Tano and Sabine Wren are confronted by Ezra whose connection to the world between worlds has given him visions of the coming destruction that Thrawn will unleash. Ezra, Sabine, and Ahsoka attempt to find Thrawn as he travels across the galaxy preparing and recruiting his forces. In order to get them off his trail, Thrawn goes to Wayland to recruit the Sabaoth clone and deploys him on Lothal where he discovers the remnant of the Jedi Temple that led to the world between worlds. Feeling this disturbance in the Force, Ezra must return to Lothal and confront Master Sabaoth. Ahsoka accompanies Ezra while Sabine responds to a summons that calls all dispersed Mandalorian clans to a meeting on Navarro. Bo-Katan summons all remaining Mandalorian clans to Navarro after the capture of Moff Gideon and the reclaiming of the Dark Saber. At the meeting, Bo-Katan proposes that the remaining Mandalorians unite under Din Djarin as their new Mandalore and retake their homeworld. She hopes that by propping up Din, a member of the tribe of the Children of the Watch, as the new Mandalore, she can convince the other Mandalorians from the same factions to aid her cause. Bo-Katan still plans on challenging Din for the Darksaber and laying claim to Mandalore herself once the planet has been retaken. Cut Quain is able to set up a secret meeting with Rex at his old homestead on Seleucami. He reveals that he knows the location of the Katana fleet because he used to secretly smuggle surviving Jango Fett clones to the Katana fleet after the Empire hunted him down and killed his family. Once the Rebel Alliance had defeated the Imperial forces at Jakku, Cut once again wanting to distance himself from his past, left the Katana fleet to rejoin the galaxy. With Thrawn hot on his trail, Cut fears that if he were to be captured by Imperial forces, the Katana fleet would fall into the hands of the Empire and the remaining clones would be wiped out. Due to the incredible significance and secrecy of this mission, Rex recruits his most trusted ally in the galaxy to help him on his mission, Ahsoka Tano. Ezra and Ahsoka arrive on Lothal and confront Sabaoth who is waiting for them at the ruins of the Jedi Temple. Ahsoka recognizes Sabaoth from her studies as a Padawan in the Jedi Temple on Coruscant as a former Jedi Master who was declared missing and presumed dead at the end of the High Republic era. After some discussion with Sabaoth, it's clear that he isn't well. Sabaoth's senses are being overloaded upon his exposure to the remnants of the Lothal Jedi Temple, and through the Force he discovers Ezra was the one that destroyed it. Sabaoth attacks Ezra and Ahsoka, unleashing an incredible power unlike anything they've seen before. He defeats Ezra and Ahsoka, but before he can kill them off, he begins to lose his grip on reality. Visions of a dark world filled with lightning fill his head as a sinister laughter fills his ears. With an insane shriek, Sabaoth flees the Lothal Temple in order to manically pursue his visions. Ahsoka is then contacted by Rex with a request for her aid in helping Cut locate the Katana fleet. As you can see, this is really just the groundwork that I would lay to begin our grand Mando Thrawn merging. But I wanted to give you this first part of my outline as an example of how the creators would go about tying in all of the elements and characters of the Mandalorian, Rebels, Clone Wars, the Bad Batch, and the original Thrawn trilogy, while also maintaining similarities to the original Thrawn trilogy's story structure and overarching plot. Like I said earlier, this was just the beginning. If you'd like to hear the entire story, let me know down in the comments below, and I can make a dedicated video outlining this saga from start to finish. And yes, Kathy, John, and Dave, I got your emails. Don't worry, I'll send you a copy of this outline tomorrow. <sighs> okay. I hope you all enjoyed this video about how to adapt the Thrawn trilogy into canon. As I said at the beginning, please like the video by hitting the thumbs up button down below, subscribe to our channel with the notification bell turned on so you can stay up to date with all the latest releases from Star Wars Lad. We post new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so you'll want to stick here for more great Star Wars content three days a week. Finally, comment below and let me know what you thought of this video, or if you have any other ideas of how you'd like to see the original Thrawn trilogy adapted into canon. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.